And we were talking about the Sacramento conference earlier. It's really great down there because you're going to be hard pressed when you teach to get through a message without somebody saying, okay, stop, let's sit down, let's have a little conversation about this. And there's, they, they watch a lot of videos down there and they finally pulled me aside and they said, we're just going to put our hand up like we have a remote control and push pause. <laughs> you just freeze and we'll have our discussion and we'll push it again and you can go again. So um, at comp Adrian and I were talking at conferences though, it, we, th those questions are great. It shows one that, that you guys are engaged in hearing what, we're, what was being taught. But those are also great thought starters. So there were two things I wanted to look at, this issue of Jesus Christ according to the flesh and the risen Jesus Christ, and why is that different, why does it matter, and then that issue, too, of how he was presented to Paul. But, you know, throughout the Old Testament, in time past, everything pointed to a Messiah coming in the flesh to redeem Israel, right? Moses said, are you going to raise a prophet up like unto me? David was told that he's going to sit on his throne forever and all the way through here. And we see as we come through, it's, it's all about according to the flesh. This Messiah is going to come. He's going to set things right. He's going to perform the miracles and the signs. He's going to heal the nation. And he's going to get them ready and prepared to go through the tribulation, come out, and then be that nation that God's going to use, that nation of priests that God's going to use. And then... They stone Stephen and they fall, and then we find out that there's a heavenly hope. The earthly hope is brought up by somebody in the flesh, Jesus Christ in the flesh. The heavenly hope is brought up by the risen G Jesus Christ coming from heaven. Look over at Romans 5. I'm sorry, Romans 15. Romans 15 and verse 8. It says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Jesus Christ, in his earthly ministry, was a minister of the circumcision, and he came to not fulfill, but to confirm the promises made to the fathers. When he's healing people, every, every example you see of healing people, somebody did in fact physically get healed, but the object lesson there was every one of those is a picture of Israel. You know, you, he heals the, the, the man that's got the, the hand, the, the palsied hand. Well, the kingdom was at hand, right? Your palsied hand, he can't grasp that kingdom. If we look down in your Romans 5, look down at verse 16. It says that I should be the minister, this is Paul, of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. That's a whole new program. That's, that's chart changing. <laughs> it looked like this, and then Jesus Christ comes, he's the minister of the circumcision to confirm those promises, and then, and if you read the next three verses, it, after it, verse 8, it says, and the Gentiles might glorify God. Verse 10, rejoice ye Gentiles. Verse 11, praise the Lord ye Gentiles. And again, Isaiah saith, there should be a root of Jesse. He shall raise to reign over the Gentiles. That's the verses 9 down to verse 14, 13, are not this issue that, okay, now Jesus Christ came. Now the Gentiles have salvation. In those verses, the reference there is Jesus Christ came to Israel, set Israel right, and now the blessings are going to flow to the Gentiles. And that's why the Gentiles are singing those songs. You come down to verse uh, 16, and you find out, whoa, Paul now, he's going to make the offering up of the Gentiles acceptable through the fall of Israel. So they're completely separate, separate roles that they have. Look over at 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh? Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. We don't follow Christ according to the flesh. We follow Christ according to the way Paul did. Adrian went through that yesterday. 
we don't we, we don't look to Christ's earthly ministry to get our marching orders today, our instruction. We don't know Christ after the flesh today. After the rapture, Israel certainly will. Because he's going to come back and set up a, a, an earthly, physical, Davidic kingdom. We don't know Jesus Christ according to the flesh today. Look over at Colossians 1.18. It's a major distinction in the way Jesus Christ is, is presented. Colossians 1, verse 18, speaking of Jesus Christ, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now there's a lot there. What I want you to see is he is the head of the body, the church. Come with me over to Matthew 19. Matthew 19 and verse 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. There Jesus Christ is presented as the King of of Israel. Now he is certainly our king. He is the king of kings. As he's presented though, he presents himself even here with Ma in Matthew as the king of Israel. Through Paul, the resurrected Jesus Christ, it's the same Jesus Christ. It's pre it's, his presentation is different. He presents himself as the head of the church. Um, the other thing I want you to see here in verse 28, Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me. This doesn't apply to Paul. Paul did not follow Jesus Christ, especially at the time this is written. Paul's probably in the audience of the Pharisees when he says, ye Pharisees, ye hypocrites. Paul's probably in the audience, or good chance he's in the audience. Um, the other thing, too, is the, this issue of, of the glory of him. And I think this is, this is really kind of a neat thing. Look over at uh, Matthew 17. Matthew 17 and get Acts 26. It's amazing if you'll sit down and study the Word of God and let the Word of God say what it means and mean what it says, how much you can get out of it. And, and even in passages, you just you, you don't think there's anything maybe there. Chapter 17 of Matthew, verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Okay. How bright was... Jesus was transfigured here. He's got Moses and Elijah on either side of him. How bright was Jesus when this happened? When Peter, James, and John looked up, what did they see the glory of the Lord as? as the sun. Okay, look over to Acts 26. This is Paul talking about his, he's, he's given an account of what happened to him when he saw Jesus. Verse 12 says, Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. So you see those, Peter, James, and John, they saw the Lord Jesus Christ transfigure. I had a picture of the kingdom coming as bright as the sun. Paul, though, saw the risen Christ, and that glory that he saw, that light that he saw, was above the brightness of the sun. Again, there's a difference there between Jesus Christ according to the flesh and Jesus Christ according to his resurrection. It's the same Jesus. People want to come along and say, oh, well, you grace believers think there's two Jesuses. No, no, no. It's not two Jesuses. It's one Jesus. It's the King of kings. It's the Lord of lords. It's the head of the church, the body of Christ. It is our Savior that died for us. But he presented himself differently, and he presents in the information to Peter and the boys and to Paul differently. So I hope that makes sense. The other thing, as I was sitting there, you can tell you're at a grace conference when the teacher says, what's a propitiation? And everybody knows. 
<laughs> in unison, it was like one of those readbacks that you get in some churches, right? What's a propitiation? Fully satisfying sacrifice. We got it. <laughs> okay. That made me chuckle. Back over to First Thessalonians. Yes, yeah, a wonder. That's right. That is a wonderful thing. Yes, I think uh, that's a that's a fun word to say. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of go through some of the stuff I didn't get through, and I can see already we won't get through it all. But like I said, this is the last book of New Doctrine and Paul's epistles, because and it's the reason it's it's the last book is you need to get oriented from the law, from that performance based acceptance system to grace. You need to understand the purpose and the calling of the body of Christ before the catching away, the day of redemption, what we call the rapture, will make any sense. If you're still oriented to the law, if you still think you're going to go into an earthly kingdom, if it, why would it make any sense that you're going to get, get raptured out of here? If you're coming along like this, and all of a sudden, 1 Thessalonians, like, you know, 1 Thessalonians, Galatians are written there, 1 Thessalonians very early, if, if you get here, and then the, you understand, okay, the charts open up, and the first thing Paul tells you is, okay, you're going to get raptured out of here, that wouldn't make any sense. There's a reason Thessalonians is not before Ephesians and is not before Romans. There's a reason that Romans is first, and then Ephesians, and then First Thessalonians, because it makes sense. If you're expecting to go through a kingdom here, if your heavenly, if you're, <laughs> your heavenly hope is on earth, if your blessed hope is on earth, does it make any sense that you're going to get raptured out of here? No, you got to get oriented correctly. So again, it wouldn't make it wouldn't make sense to put Thessalonians in front of Romans. It wouldn't make it to put be, put it behind John or Acts. It would just be total confusion. The attacks on the catching away on the the rapture began in Paul's day, early in his ministry. But being in Christ, as we've seen this weekend, we have been delivered from the wrath to come, and we do have hope. Paul tells us we are appointed. And we're going to look at a li little bit of this. We are appointed to tribulation in our lives here on earth but we are not appointed to the wrath to come. That's a big difference. The wrath to come, if you go and study it out, study out some of the things Jesus has to say about the wrath to come, it's going to be a worse time than any other time since the world began. I mean, you get some time, think about some of the bad things that have happened on the earth, including the flood. I mean, it's easy, you know, we, uh, kind of in our time frame, right? It's the last hundred years, and we, cause was, we think of all the Holocaust and, and things like that, the Indonesian... Um, earthquake and tsunami a few years ago. But when Jesus said that it's going to be a time worse than any other time on the planet, that includes a flood. That, I mean, there's some really bad things. It's going to be a terrible time where people are going to want to die to get out of it and are not going to be able to die. But we don't have to go through that. How discouraging would it be to know you're going to live this life in all its tribulations and you're going to, and then just because you're on the planet, and then you're being a Christian, you're appointed to suffering, so you're going to go through those sufferings, and then you're going to die, and if you don't die, you get to go through the tribulation. And then, as you go through the tribulation, there's not even, you have to endure to the end. There would not be any hope there. There would be absolutely no hope. Everybody that believes, physical Jew or physical Gentile today, is going to get raptured out of here. Nobody that gets saved today has to worry about this. The only people that have to worry about this, if the rapture happened right now, the only people that would have to worry about going through the tribulation are the people that didn't believe anyhow. Does that make sense? If you believe in the dispensation of grace, you don't got to worry about it. There's great hope, great comfort there. We've seen several times this weekend that Paul says, comfort one another with these words. Edify one another with these words. We are appointed to suffer for Christ. We are not appointed to wrath. First attack on the dispensation of grace is not to deny the cross. It's to deny the hope, the catching away. We live in a point in time where our Every single group on the planet, you can't say anything offensive against except Christianity. And it's free, it's free, it's, it's fair game. And it's, it's, 
it's one of those issues that can be disheartening. But the attacks, the attacks from the world, they, for me anyhow, the attacks of the world, they fall on deaf ears. I, I, people want to come along. I mean, I've got a family member and, and that, that does this. And, you know, they want to mock Christianity and believe in, in their, you know, the, the big bearded friend in the sky and, and this book of fairy tales. And, you know, those are easy for me. I can look at those people and say, okay, you just don't have a clue. The information's there. You've just rejected it. Re rejected it. You're, you're, you're full of the wisdom of this world. Okay. The attacks that, that, that are so, for me, disheartening is when they come from the Christian community and attacks on the dispensation of grace and... Making marginalizing a person, or making a person feel like you know it's uh, April shared tr tried to share some stuff with some people this week, and they said, okay, well that's nice, let's move on, and, you know, and it's it's that kind of discouraging thing th that happens today. Christianity, so th my point is, though, the attacks in cr Christianity are not the, there's nobody th there's not a Christian that says Jesus didn't die for my sins. What a Christian is going to come along and say is, there is no rapture. They call it, oh, you mean the secret rapture? And when they say, that, say it like that, it's not a compliment. They say, well, we are going to go through this. I need to, get, I need to take care of everything and make sure that I'm prepared to go through that. My Social Security card is the mark of the beast. My credit card is the mark of the beast. All they're doing is taking away the rapture, taking away the hope, and starting to tear down the hope that a person has based on the teachings, based on the sound doctrine and the truth that Paul presents to us. That's the first attack on the dispensation of grace, is to say that there's no rapture. Or they'll just say, you are going to be raptured, but you're still going it, to, but it's not going to happen until the middle or the end of the tribulation. My point is, and I hope we've, we've made it clear this weekend, we do have a hope not to go, not to go through that. And again, I, I said yesterday, it's not escapism. It's what Paul tells us we're appointed to. And it, it has to do with our role on earth here today and understanding we don't need to get caught up in preparing for this or worrying about this. We can put our focus on what our role here on earth is, is ambassadors for Christ, is getting people saved and then bringing them to the knowledge of the truth. Look at Second Thess First Thessalonians, chapter one, verse uh, one. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is grace and peace. It's not simply a greeting. That is a declaration from the apostle of the Gentiles that God is offering grace and peace to the world today. Again, it is commonly taught that one is the, one is the Greek word and the other one is the Hebrew word that's been translated into English. I love what Adrian said yesterday. I had to agree with him. I don't know Hebrew and I don't know Greek. I know one Greek word, rapturo. <laughs> and hero, but I'm told I say it wrong. Again, it's not simply a greeting. It is, it is the declaration of what the dispensation of grace is all about. Look over at 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians five, verse nineteen. Verse uh, seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ, hath given to us 
the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. God is not imputing the trespasses to the world today. It's a very difficult thing for people to come to an understanding of because they want to keep themselves under the law. If you can get that, you can go a long way to taking, getting yourself away from that performance-based system of being in the law. Now, the, the Thessalonians were those, were, were those ambassadors. They had turned from idols to the living God. They were doing the faith, love, and hope. They were declaring grace and peace to the world today. Look over at Romans 3, Romans 2. See, if God was imputing trespasses to the, to the world today, he'd have to be zapping everybody, right? What's, what's the deal with the law? We, Adrian talked about it. Paul was blameless in regards to the law. doesn't mean he didn't sin, but when he did sin, that sin had been imputed to him, so he had to go and do the law and do that, keep that short account system. Okay, God's not doing that today. However, look at um, Romans 2, verse... Oh, what do I want here? Verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Thinkest thou this, O man, and judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Okay? Just because you're not getting your sins imputed to you does not mean you're going to escape the judgment of God. Verse 4. Or despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and an impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. God is proclaiming grace and peace to the world today. He'll give you up to the very last second of your life. A true deathbed conversion will put you in Christ. Now, if you reject that, though, Romans 2 tells you when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to be judged according to your works. You can be judged according to your works, or you can miss the judgment seat of Christ and be in Christ and have the righteousness of God. That makes sense? Looks like I could, did I say that? Did I confuse you? If you're in Christ, you're not going to the judgment seat of Christ. You just, I'm, I got it backwards. I got it backwards. You're not going to the great white throne judgment. Totally backwards. I mean, I knew that was going to happen. If you reject the gospel, you will go to the great white throne judgment. You will get judged according to your works, and you will get escorted to, where is it, the lake of fire. If you are in Christ, you will go to the judgment seat of Christ, where the bad things that you've done, the things you've done that haven't been in Christ will get burned up, and you'll receive praise of God, and you'll go into heaven. I hope I said that right. We are not appointed to the great white throne judgment. Okay? My point is, this is a time of grace and peace to the world today. When Paul opens his, his book saying grace and peace, it's not just a pleasant greeting where he's trying to incorporate everybody. He is making a declaration of the, of the situation in the but now, in the times that are happening today. Okay, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 1, verse 2. It says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in your prayers. In our prayers. Wow, thank you. Must be tired. It's almost like I was up a good portion of the night. <laughs> Paul prays for these saints as he did for all the churches. His prayers are prayers of thanksgiving. Not only he was thankful that they were saved, but he was thankful for them. We give thanks to God always for you all. 
He was just thankful that they were. Look at First Thessalonians 5, verse 18. Prayer is an interesting, um, I don't want to call it a thing, but it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting way to, to, to um, communicate with God, and you should do it. Um, consistently, when you see Paul start talking about his prayers, the first thing he says is, I give thanks. I am thankful. Um, that's a heart of gratitude that we need to have, and it needs to be expressed in our prayers. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 In everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. The Thessalonians were perfecting the saints. They were doing the work of ministry. They were edifying the body of Christ. They were being thankful. Paul he comes around and reminds them that they need to continue with that. In all things give thanks. Everybody wants to know, I wish I could figure out God's will for my life today. That verse is pretty clear. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you and you and me. If you want to know the will of God for your life, if you want to know the specific will of God for your particular life today, it isn't to everything give thanks. You don't know the will of God through the circumstances of life, but you know it through the word of God, which is the only way to discover the will of the Lord today. You don't learn <laughs> that it's the will of God to be thankful in everything through the circumstances of life. Right? You only learn that through the word of God. The circumstances of life teach just the opposite. Be bitter, angry, resentful, not thankful. Learn to be thankful through the word of God, no matter the circumstances of life. This is not thank, and be careful here. This is not thankful for everything. It is thankful in everything. And there's, there's a difference there. You don't need to be thankful for calamity. You need to be thankful in that calamity. You need to, going through that, maybe, the, maybe all you can find to be thankful in is, God, you died for me and you saved me and I'm struggling right now and I know I've got some comfort in you. That's where your heart starts to change. You're not caught up in the circumstances of life anymore. And we all know the circumstances of life sometimes can be devastating. We're not talking about, you know, sometimes it's a little more than a bad day at work. Sometimes it's a little more than missing Survivor on Wednesday nights. <laughs> That's pretty bad. <laughs> to have the mind of Christ is to have a heart of thankful not, thankfulness in all the circumstances of life. I understand it can be hard. I live here. I raised two teenage daughters. I know what it's like to have some tribulation. But that's the will of God in Christ concerning you, is to be thankful. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 1, verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. They were doing the work of faith, the labor of love, and the patience of hope. They were doing the work. Notice here, too, that the first two are doing. The third thing, the third do is not a doing. The work of faith, the love, labor of love, that's the perfecting of the saints. That's the work of the ministry, edification of the body of Christ. Doing that work will allow you to patiently wait for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you're, you're getting built up in the doctrine. You're coming to the truth of sound doctrine. Doing that work is how you patiently wait for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that the patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We've come to see this weekend that that issue of the hope is our catching away. The church today... I'm going to be piling on, but I'm seeing, I, I see a lot of this in my interaction with, some, with, with people right now. The church today is desperately trying to do the work that will bring in the kingdom today. They're very, very open about that. It's not a secret. We're sharing the gospel to make the world a better place so that 
the kingdom will come back in. You know, that's not what, that's not what Scripture talks about. Scripture talks about patiently waiting. It talks about being an ambassador for Christ. <coughs> Running around, doing the religious works to bring in the kingdom. Does that sound like the patience of hope? That sounds like trying to hurry something along. It's not. The church today is not fostering the unity of the faith, is not perfecting and maturing the saints, it's keeping them children. It's not edifying the body of Christ, it's trying to make the body of Christ spiritual Israel, the bride of Christ. They're trying to do the Great Commission in order to bring in the kingdom. Remember when we, we looked at Acts yesterday, we saw Peter at Pentecost. He stood up and said, hey, this is what Joel said. This is the last days. Go over at 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. And those, those last days that Peter was talking about, they're going to be a, a time of wrath and vengeance, right? 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times... Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Peter talks about the last days. He's talking about the last days of Israel's program, right? Paul, he talks about, what's the exact phrase he uses? In the latter times. What are the latter times Paul's talking about? It'd be the, e the end of the dispensation of grace, right? Because that's what Paul's, right? That's what Paul's talking, that's what Paul's issue is. He says that in the latter times, shun thou depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing devils. Neither Peter or Paul, in either the prophecy program or the mystery program, thought that the earth was going to get so good that Jesus was going to be comfortable enough to come back and set up his kingdom. It's not, that's, n it's our job to get people saved and bring them the knowledge of the truth. It's not to make the world a better place so Jesus can come back and set up his kingdom. That's just a fundamental misunderstanding of, of at best, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of, of scripture. And at worst, we've been looking at it, it is an intentional it is the intent of the teacher to, to lie and wait to deceive people. It's just not the issue there. Look over at Acts 1. The issue is not that man can make the world good enough for Jesus to come back to. The issue is that only God can restore the universe to its created glory by gathering all things in Christ, things which both are in heaven and are on earth. Acts chapter 1, verse 6, Peter's question. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Peter's not waiting. Again, we're talking about Israel's program here. But Peter's not waiting for it to get really good. He's saying, hey, okay, you've died. You've fulfilled the timeline. The world's a terrible place. Are you going to set up your kingdom now? Well, Peter, it's not for you to know. But there's no indication that, that it's, our, it's our responsibility to make the world a better place. Because one, how's man doing? Is there a program man's put on the planet that, that works? Every time we try and fix something, we, we, we make it worse. I was thinking about this. This is how bad. We're, we're supposed to have dominion over this planet, right? And... It, I'm about as far right as you can get on the political spectrum, and this is going to make me sound like a big lefty, but, man, we are destroying this planet. We, 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 you know, April and I have started a hike, and we go on these hikes of beautiful nature. There's candy bar wrappers, and there's... Do you realize we have junk on the moon? We have junk on Mars? I think we have, we have garbage on Saturn. We are not good at taking care of this planet. What makes us think that on a spiritual level we're going to make it any better? It is not our job to make the world a happy place so that Jesus can come back. It's our job as ambassadors for Christ to share the gospel. That's even different than Israel's role 
is going to be and, and when Jesus does set up the kingdom. We are to do the work of an ambassador and patiently wait for our catching away for the day of redemption. We're not doing the work of faith, the labor of love, to bring in the kingdom or even to hasten the rapture. Well, we'll make it good enough and we'll get enough people saved. We'll hit that magic number that, that God's waiting for and we're going to do it in a hurry and then we can hurry the rapture out of here. No, we are to patiently wait. Every day that the God delays the rapture is one more day of grace, is one more day that we have a job to do, and we need to get about doing that job. Look over at Romans 5. Romans 5, verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, and experience hope. Hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. With that in mind, look over to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. Tribulation works for us. Paul says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations. How are you doing with that one? Are you guys excited to get, go through tribulation? Boy, there's a, yeah, but we glory in tribulations? Well, you know what? In tri tribulation, there's an, there's an opportunity to find something to be thankful in it. There's an opportunity to put the life of Christ on display. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted, above that ye are able, but will with temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. The work of faith, the labor of love, has to do with that edification process. The growth in us and our ability to help others. We experience tribulation. We trust the word of God as we go through it. We understand that God is faithful that God will not suffer us and not allow us to be tempted above that we're able to bear it. That w we understand that that temptation, that tribulation we're going through, it works patience. That patient works experience. You come through it relying on the word of God. You come through it being thankful in everything. You gain experience, you gain understanding, you gain knowledge. The experience you gain is through relying on the word of God. It's not through the circumstances of life, though you may get, pick up a little experience through that. But when your life experience tells you one thing and the Word of God says another, which is the reality? I'm sure we've all experienced that. Can be a, that can be tough to you. It can be tough sometimes when you're in, in the middle of whatever you're going through. Man, I know that verse says that, but I'll deal with that one tomorrow. You know, or I don't know if that one and you know it is. But that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's why, as we go through tribulation, we need to get to the point where we rely on the word of God. That experience that you gain through relying on the word of God, it brings something. It brings hope. It brings hope because no matter what, you are not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Spirit that seals us we saw earlier, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Let's go, actually go look at that. Look at Romans 8, verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 38 and 39 is every single possible situation that can come up in life. 
every single possible situation is listed there, and none of those things can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. It strikes me in verse 33 and 34, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who is he that condemneth? The world tells you, Christianity tells you, you're not godly. You have sin in your life. You need to confess. God's punishing you, and you must repent. You're not worthy of God's love. And you will not be worthy of God's love until you repent. But you turn to the word of God, and that tells you that God's not going to allow you to be tempted above what you're able. It tells you to be thankful in everything. It tells you to pray without ceasing. And since you're praying, and since you're being thankful, why not talk to God about this tribulation you're going through? And then you find a verse that says to stay away from those that tell you that gain is godliness. Because that's what these people, these people that are putting this charge against you, they're saying you're not godly. They would know you were godly if you were having gain, if you were having great prosperity in your life. That's how you would know. So that you could tell if God is happy with you or not by the circumstances of your life. But you find, like I said, that verse that says, stay away from people that tell you gain is godliness. Because you know through the word of God that God's not punishing you today. You find another verse that says nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Another one that says nothing can separate you from the love of God. We just read. You find another verse that says you've been delivered from the wrath to come. And another one that says you're not appointed to wrath. And that you have hope knowing that you're not appointed to wrath. And that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Or the love of the Father. The, hope of, the patience of hope is that patience, that understanding, that knowledge, and that peace that comes from understanding sound doctrine. Specifically, what we're talking about this weekend is that doctrine of the rapture that kept you away the day of redemption, that you're sealed to this day, that you can rely on the word of God in the circumstances of life, no matter what the world tells you, no matter what Christianity tells you, no matter what you tell you. Our worst critics are ourselves. We condemn ourselves probably more than anybody else because, for one, we know what's going on in our brains. These verses you come to rely on, and they say, you know what? Oh, wretched man that I am, you don't need to feel that way. Walk in the spirit and not after the flesh, and you won't have that self-condemnation. What are we talking about? We're talking about getting to the point in our lives or like we were talking about it in the hall earlier. Jesus had every thought and every action when he was on earth to the complete will of his Father and the Word of God. That is where we need to get to. Complete reliance on the Word of God. Look over at Titus 2, verse 13. looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That doctrine, that doctrine of our blessed hope is where our, is where our hope is found. Christ, which is our hope. All promises of God are found in Christ. The patience of hope, that blessed hope, which is that glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now this is not saying, this is not talking about two different people. This is calling our Savior Jesus Christ is God. Look at Titus 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, that hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Christ is our hope, and in him we have the promise of eternal life, and we patiently wait for him to return. For the dead in Christ arise first, and then those of us that remain alive 
and that we'll forever be with the Lord. That's the promise that God made to God's elect. Look back at 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 4. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. I'm trying to figure out if we have time to go through our election of God. Um, we'll start a little bit. They knew their election of God. Like I said yesterday, this is, not the, this is not the issue that before the beginning of the world, God elected those that would and would not be saved. Okay? Um, look at uh, Titus 2.11. Titus 2.11. For the grace, that God, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Look back at 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. Verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. It is God's will that everybody gets saved. Okay? That doesn't mean it's going to happen. Again, this kind of goes what we were talking about yesterday with God's uh, sovereignty. They say, well, if it's God's will, it will happen. Adrian read the thing. I don't know if you guys caught it today. If I look back at Acts 7. Acts 7, verse 51. Is it? Uh, Stephen's sermon. Ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. It's God's will that all men get saved, but there are going to be men that are going to resist. You can resist. That's another seducing doctrine that, well, if God willed it, it will happen. God has a plan. His plan will come to fruition regardless of what man does. But it is, we just read, it is God's, God's will that all men get saved. But we saw yesterday, it pleased him to save those that believe. His will is that all would believe, but only, he's only going to save those that do. Look at Colossians 3, verse 12. Put on there for as the elect of God. You are the elect of God. If you're saved, you are the elect of God. You are elect of God because you have forgiveness. Here's, your, here's some titles as the elect of God. Holy and beloved. You're the elect of God. You're holy. You're beloved. You are to put on bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. You see the difference there between what Paul teaches by revelation of the risen Lord Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ taught in the flesh on the earth? What's the Lord's Prayer? Well, look, at, look at the end of Matthew 5. Probably should keep a hand there. Is it Matthew 6? Yep, Matthew 6. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I love this. Right? I think, it, I think everybody probably knows the Lord's Prayer. It is, it is probably the most vainly repeated, repetitively repeated prayer out there, right? Verse, we'll start with that in mind in verse uh, 7. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do. Anyhow, verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in heaven, as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom, thy will be done in earth, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Okay? If you forgive men, God will forgive you. Right? That's what Jesus says here in the prayer. What's Paul say in Colossians 3? Verse 13. Right. Uh, Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. See, your forgiveness is a done deal. You don't forgive others so that you get forgiveness. You forgive others because you are forgiven. They get forgiven at the cross the same way you got forgiven at the cross. And what you did to God was worse than what they did to you. I mean, I feel like it. But you violated God's justice. It's a hard issue. It's a hard of, it's, it's an issue of gratitude. And it's, again, the difference between knowing Jesus Christ after the flesh and knowing the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ as we re- get revealed to us through Paul. What time are we at, Bill? 50? Okay. Look at the First Timothy, First Thessalonians two, verse thirteen. For, yeah, First Thessalonians two, verse thirteen. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You know, when it comes down to it, guys, that's what we're talking about. The word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And there's two issues here. The Word of God only works in those that believe. Okay? The only thing it does for somebody that doesn't believe is convict them of their sin. Nobody ever got saved from hell that didn't come to the conclusion first they knew they were going to hell. Also, the Word of God effectually worketh also in you that believe, that believe the verses. We talk about this a lot. It's an easy one. To use as an example, sin shall not have dominion over you. That's a fact. That's the reality of the life we live in Christ. Sin does not have dominion over us. That is very difficult sometimes in the way we live our lives to come to the because sometimes that prayer, I've said it many times. I know God, your word says that sin doesn't have dominion over me, but right now, it feels like it's more than I can take. It does feel. Like sin has dominion over me. And you got to get to that point where you say, okay, that verse says that. I'm going to believe it. I know how I feel, and I know how strong this is, but I'm going to rest in that verse, in another verse, in another verse. That's why we look at so many verses. The Holy Spirit only can convict you through the verses, not through a queasy feeling in your tummy, not through a red light or a green light. Not through getting a check in the mail that you didn't know was coming. Or not getting a check in the mail that you thought was coming. You get convicted through the verses. And when you're living your life, do you trust the circumstances of life and how you feel? Or do you trust the Word of God and what it tells you? What is your reality? Look over at look at Isaiah fifty five. Does any 
anybody need this anymore? Okay. We can get it for you if you need it. Isaiah 55, verse 11. WD-40, yes, April. <laughs> you know, two lefties in my family. One of them answers to everything is WD-40. The other one is duct tape. Speaking of the Word of God, Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I have pleased, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. I understand what we're reading here. The truth of the matter is God's word will accomplish what he sent it to accomplish. It is God's word is where we find the gospel, which is the power of salvation. It's God's word that will work effectually in us, in us that believe. God promises that it will accomplish that which it pleases. It pleases God to get the saints edified. It pleases God to get men saved. It pleases God for men to come to the knowledge of the truth. But again, it's relying on the word of God, not on the experiences of life. One more I wanted to bring up, I talked a little bit about yesterday. Look over to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1 and verse 9. It says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. We looked at the verses yesterday, 2 Timothy 2.15, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. Um, was it Romans 12? Yeah, Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Why should we study to be a workman that needeth not be ashamed? Why should we try not to be ashamed? Why should we walk in a manner that is acceptable unto God? Why is it reasonable? It's who you are. You are accepted in the beloved. All Paul's telling you to do is to walk in who you are. Live out of the identity of who you are. This is the reality of your life in Christ. Some days it doesn't feel like it. Some moments it doesn't feel like it. Some moments you don't feel worthy of it. A lot of your Christian friends will tell you, you're not worthy. I know a lot of people that wake up every day, I'm going to please God today at the end of the day. Oh, wretched man that I am, because they failed God all day. Yeah, you know, you, you probably did. You probably didn't live today perfectly. If that's news to you, get in the book and study it. This is the reality of who you are in Christ. We talk about knowing who you are in Christ, coming to that knowledge. Boy, this is a good place to start, that you are accepted in the beloved. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. So when we talk about living holy, acceptable unto God, be a workman that needeth not be ashamed, just live in who you are. Understand who you are and let that live out of you. Let Christ's life live out of you. Dear Heavenly Father, as our conference here this weekend comes to a close, I thank you for the opportunity to come together in fellowship with the saints and to look at your word. Rude, guys. And the fellowship around your word and, and to understand that we our identity is that we are accepted in the beloved. In us is no good thing. 
but we are accepted in the beloved. We have the righteousness of God in Christ. And my prayer for all of us would be that we would let that, let the reality of that identity sink into our soul. That we would come to the point where we do live out of that identity in the circumstances of life. We come to trust your word over the circumstances of life. We do not condemn ourselves. That we do rely on you. We do understand that it is a walk of faith and that you've given us everything we need, your word and your Holy Spirit, where we can do that walk of faith. And we can walk in the Spirit and not suffer from that self-condemnation, Lord. Again, I think that we're able to come together, fellowship around your word, your word rightly divided, come to an understanding of our hope, our blessed hope, the Lord Jesus Christ and our eternity that we are going to spend with him. We praise you for that, Lord. In your name, amen.